All right. Well, hey, we are live and uh, just about ready to get started with our webinar here today. want to welcome everybody who is watching us live. Thank you so much, but also welcome all the folks that are joining us in the future and watching the recording of this. Uh, whichever way you're joining us, we just really appreciate you being with us. For those that are with us live today, uh, please feel free to take advantage of the YouTube chat. Um, if you wanna start off by introducing yourself and saying where you're from in the chat, uh, that would be great uh, to say howdy in there. Um, and if you have questions throughout the session, that's going to be the best way to uh, communicate with us. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat over here on the side uh, to look for any questions or comments that come up. But uh, David will be doing uh, the uh, main presentation here. And we are at 3.30. So I'm going to go ahead and do a quick introduction to go ahead and get us started here. So thanks again so much for being here today for this webinar about Mathagon. Uh, before we do anything else, I just want to let people have a, a quick understanding of what it is we're going to be taking a look at here today. So Mathagon is a free tool. Uh, those of you that know me know I'm all about free things. And so there's no sales pitch. There's nothing like that here at all. Everything I share through my uh, my blog and things I share, uh, the resources, I always am looking for uh, tools that are free for schools to use. And that is so, so very important. And so I'm so excited when I came across Mathagon. I've seen it on and off over the last year or so. And I have shared little bits and pieces of it out on Twitter and in different resources. And I uh, recently got a chance to connect with uh, David Porras. And David um, is a math teacher, but also uh, works you know, with Mathagon um, and is going to be uh, sharing today about how uh, you can use this wonderful free tool with your students. And uh, with that said, I'm going to turn this over uh, to David. Again, all throughout the time, if you guys have questions, comments, throw them in the YouTube chat. I will then relay, relay those on to David. But uh, David, why don't you go ahead and give us an introduction about yourself and uh, have at it. Great. Thank you so much, Eric, for having me this afternoon. Welcome, everyone, those that are live and those that are watching this. After the fact, it's great to be with you talking about Mathagon. My name is David Porras. As Eric said, I am a sixth and seventh grade math teacher in Weston, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. I've been doing that for 20 years or so now, and I've been working on the content team at Mathagon for a little bit over a year. I came across Mathagon as a teacher uh, about a year and a half ago as I was looking for ways to enhance the work I was doing with students, and I stumbled across, uh, across Mathagon, got really excited about the courses about the manipulatives on polypod and uh, have been lucky enough to be part of the content team for about a year or so now. So I'm going to spend um, a good bit of time talking about polypad, which is our virtual manipulatives. And then I'm going to talk about the courses on Mathagon and some of the activities. I'm going to show you where on Mathagon you can find videos on tutorials, other webinars that we've done. So as I go through this, it might be a little fast as you're trying to take in every piece, but obviously you can come back and watch this recording as well as I'll share with you places to go on Mathagon to get more information. So here I am at mathagon.org and the first area we're going to explore is Polypad. So I've clicked on Polypad. It's our virtual manipulatives. Um, and here we are on Polypad. So we call this blank white space on Polypad the canvas, where we're going to do our mathematical work. And on the left here are the tiles. And you can see the tiles are in a number of categories, geometry, numbers, fractions, algebra, probability, tools, and utensils. So I'm going to first give an overview, a real quick overview of a number of the tile types. And then I'll share with you some activities I've done in my classes, activities I can envision at other other age groups of students. Again, I'm a sixth and seventh grade math teacher. Um, so let's start in the geometry section and I'm gonna go to polygons. And the first thing that I wanna point out is the number of ways to get a tile on the canvas. I could click and the square goes on the canvas. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit to make it bigger. I can, uh, I can pan around the canvas with the two finger scroll on my mouse pad. There's a pan option on the right over here to pan around as well. Um, then I'm gonna put a, uh, a triangle on the canvas. And the first thing that I want to point out, there's a toolbar at the bottom and the options change based on the tile type that you have chosen. So here 
I've selected a polygon and you can see there's an option to flip and cut the polygon. So I can flip it, I can move it around. This handle allows me to do a rotation and there's also a cut feature. And so I can take this and with the dotted line, I can cut that polygon into two pieces. Obviously the square can do the same thing when I flip it, you don't notice anything happening, but it is flipping. And so there's all sorts of wonderful exploration students could do with these polygons. There's smart uh, rotation and smart snapping of polygons together. You might be able to see as, I, as it gets closer, it snaps together. I can hold down shift and choose two of the tiles. I'm gonna be copying tiles a lot in this webinar. I just wanna show you two ways to copy. One down here, there's a copy button. So if I click, I can make a copy. I'm gonna spin it and then snap these together. I overspun a little bit. Uh, and then the other way to make a copy, which I find myself doing a lot, is if I just tap C on the keyboard, the letter C, I don't need to do Command C if I'm copying it on a canvas. So if I just tap C on my keyboard, which I just did, it makes a copy. And I find that is a little bit, um, is quicker than going down here all the time to make a copy. So I just made another copy. I'm gonna spin it around. You might see where I'm going here. Oh, I think I have one too many triangles or something. There we go, oh, oh goodness. There we go, this was not in the right spot. Here we go, let me move this down a little bit. I rotated it, there we go. I'm gonna make this nicer as I put it together. And we can see this nice shape that I made and I'm gonna put a hexagon right in the middle. So there's a nice shape I've made with the polygons. I'm now gonna hold down shift while I select a number of these, make a copy, put it over here, make one more copy, put it over here. You might see where I'm going now. I'm making a tessellation with these shapes and as I spin it, and then I can make this whole copy and now I'm off and running with my tessellation. So I've shared a number of ways to do this with my students in school and they've had wonderful times coming up with all sorts of wonderful artistic patterns with tessellations. We've talked about what makes a tessellation, how you can decide if shapes are gonna tessellate or not. I could spend an hour today talking about tessellations, but I'm not going to. So there's an example of, of a polygon. All of these, you can put them on the canvas, you can spin them, you can move them, you can cut them. But if you wanna make a custom polygon, there's one here where you can see the vertices are in white. And if I drag that onto the canvas and zoom in a little bit, now I can move the vertices around to make any kind of shape that I want. If I wanna add a vertex, you can see as my cursor uh, goes on top of the line, it, on, on the edge, it changes to a plus. And if I click there, I've, add, I've added a vertex to the shape. So I can add as many as I want. If I have too many and I click on the, on the vertex, it goes away. So I'll get to four. And maybe here's a shape that I really like. And I wanna use that shape and not make any changes to it by accident. So you can see an option that was not available on the, on the fixed polygons, but on the custom polygon is an opportunity to fix the vertices. So I fixed it and now that, that polygon is stuck. I can still copy it, right? I can spin it around. We can change colors. I'll make this one orange maybe. I could take this whole thing and copy it and move it around. And I'm off and running on another tessellation. My students have made all sorts of wonderful shapes with these types of tessellations, it always is very satisfying when it snaps in just like that, right? And so we could copy and paste this and cover this plane with this shape and uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of fun we've had making those types of, of tessellations. So that's the polygon category. Again, we could spend a whole, whole hour just talking about polygons. Oh, those those are awesome. I'm gonna go ahead and interject one quick question for you, David. This Great. is uh, so much fun already. Um, a question came up about the platforms that this can be used on. I know a lot of schools uh, do use Chromebooks. That's a very common thing, but somebody had also asked about uh, mobile devices such as iPads. Is this uh, platform dependent? Uh, does it work on, on everything? It does, it works on everything. It works on, uh, on browsers. There also is an iPad app, uh, an Android app, um, an iOS app, so it can work on mobile devices as well. Not all of the features that you'll find on a, um, on a browser uh, are in the app, uh, but there is a, a decent amount of things that are on the, on the website are available on the app as well. 
So do you recommend if somebody is using, for example, an iPad, that it'd be better for them to use the mobile app that is optimized for the iPad rather than using the uh, web site within a browser on the iPad, for example? Yeah, uh, we would suggest to, to uh, start with the app. And then if there are specific features that they find aren't available yet on the app, then they could go to a browser on the, on the device. Excellent. Very Great good. Question. Thanks so much. Yeah, no worries. Keep, keep jumping in as the questions come. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on from the section in geometry. There are tangrams we could spend time with, pentominoes and tetrominoes, penrose tiles. There, uh, there are links under, under some of the tiles to get more information. You can click here to find out more about column tiles, fractals, and tantric tiles are super fun. But I'm going to jump to numbers, and we could spend um, a lot of time talking about numbers, but the first category are these number tiles. And so here is a group of 10, which I've put on the canvas. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. On the right-hand side, there are a number of settings. One is to add a grid to the background. So I would like to have a grid background for these number tiles. And so there's 10. I'm going to add another 10 and another 10. So here's a group of 30. If I select all of the tiles, all of the number tiles, one of the options at the bottom here that was not there with polygons is here for the number tiles says merge the tiles. So I merge them and it makes one block of 30 with this tab here. And what is wonderful as you move the tab, it makes different rectangular arrays of the number 30. So there is three times 10, here's five times six. I like to also focus on things like this where my with my students to show that I could split these tiles now and make the two in a different color to show that 30 is four times seven plus two. And so whole, I've made all these wonderful lessons I can show you, I'll, I will show you in a few minutes where on Mathagon you can find examples of lessons here, but just exploring factor pairs of numbers with these number tiles has been great. Here's a, a hundred block, I could split it and I'm now going to, uh, there we go, there we go, sorry. I'm gonna first split it and remove 20 of them and add a one and then merge them back together to make a block of 81. And you can see that made it a square, but could you have a whole lesson on using number tiles to explore uh, square numbers, right? Could be um, a great explanation for students. Let me keep going through the number options here. There are number bars, sometimes called Cuisinaire rods. And so I can put a few on the canvas. Let's do eight and seven and three. And I know if, um, some of you who might use these a lot might say, those aren't the right colors. Those aren't the Cuisinaire rod colors that we have in school. And so under settings, there are a number of options. One is to change the colors of the tiles. And so if I click on that, you can see then the colors of the bars change to the typical colors that students have in school. There's also an option here to hide the number labels. And so when I choose that option, the numbers on the bars go away. So I'm gonna put those back on, but I wanted to show you that option as well. And now I could build this in the different colors. So we could do, I don't know, a nine and a three. And does a six get me there? Let's see, yep, it does. And then under the tools and utensils, we have a number line. So I could put a number line underneath the bars. You could see that doesn't look right. That eight and four don't match up because as a default, the width of the number line is two. You can see when I click on the number line, a panel comes up in the top right. I'm gonna change the width to one and then you can expand the number line. There we go. So I've made the number 18 in a couple of different ways there. So those are the number bars. The prime factor circles, I've had way too much fun with my students with the prime factor circles. If you play the game Prime Climb and you've seen these prime factor uh, circles from Dan Finkel's work over at Math for Love, these were certainly made in collaboration with Dan. Here's a link to his game here. Uh, it's a wonderful math board game that I certainly encourage you to go check out and have a good time with. The way these prime factor circles work, here's the number 18. And you can see that 18 is made up of a two, an orange and a green and a green, and you can pull them apart. So 18 is two times three times three to show the prime factorization. I've talked for years with my students how prime factorization is like the building blocks of numbers, the DNA, it's what you put together to make numbers and to be able to actually do it and put them back together and take them apart 
has been a really powerful way for kids to make sense of, of prime factorization. And so here is 18. You can type in any number down here that you might want to add to the canvas. I'll do 150. Um, I like to copy it so I can see what that, what that number was. So we know 150 has a two and a three and a couple fives in it. I found that my students often would talk about the prime factorizations as colors. They would say, oh, there's an orange one in there and there's a green one in there. And I think for some that felt like a safer entry into prime factorization. Um, and here, obviously we could have so many wonderful conversations about common factors. They both have an orange. So we both, the two goes into both of them. They both have a green. So they both have three as a common, fa as a common factor. What's the biggest one? We can make factor pairs of 150, right? 10 times 15, there's a factor pair. We could do 25 times six, there's another factor pair. So again, I could spend an hour talking about prime factor circles. They are so much fun. I, I, I've had a great time exploring those. Well, David, I gotta tell you that this is, this is fantastic. Uh, a lot of times when we think about virtual manip manipulatives, we think about like, oh, it's um, maybe uh, just some um, you know polygons that we're going to move around on the screen, or we have a manipulative version um, of a number line, and that's wonderful. But the fact that these are so they are truly manipulative; <laughs> they are interactive. It's not just a digital representation of something I could have bought physically. Because I mean, I, I used to teach math. Um, I was a, a middle school math teacher for the first seven years of my uh, education career. And, you know, I had pattern blocks and I had, you know, uh, number cubes and all those things. And they were wonderful to give that concrete under understanding, but they were not malleable. <laughs> and I just love that. What a, what a wonderful examples you've shown of showing, you know, uh, the, the, the prime factorization and being able to really see that, uh, the, uh, the different products, the way you can, you know, multiply different, you know, factors to, uh, to, to make these, these products and showing that visually fantastic. So very, very good. Um, awesome. Something to keep in the back of your mind. We've had one question come in, and if it doesn't fit into this spot right here, just want to have it in the back of your mind. Somebody was asking about solving linear linear equations. So just something to tuck away in there. If that's one thing that fits into something you're going to share at some point, that question did come up about how it public is, path can be used for that. It is coming soon. I'm going to keep going through the numbers and then under algebra, Perfect. I will share an example of that, but I love the question. And yeah, I found that as well, the, that ability to take a manipulative and on Polypad, I've used the ones that provide enhanced value to what I could do in the classroom. There will always be a need for something physical, right? This is not to replace any, you know, all physical things that we do in school. Obviously this past year, a lot of us, myself included, had gravitated to virtual ones because we can't use the physical, but there are certainly activities and lessons where when we're able to, again, I will be using the physical ones for, uh, you know, for some lessons. And then there are other ones where the tools on Polypad or other sites have added value as well. So I think in all these technologies, it's about being thoughtful about in this lesson, what am I trying, what are the goals of this lesson or unit and what tools can best enhance the learning for students. Um, so I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going here. I want to show you the uh, number cards. Let me just zoom in on the canvas. You know, these are cards where you can put them on, on the, on the canvas. And when you put one card on top of the other, it finds the sum of those cards. Now, again, under settings, there's an option to not have the number tiles be merged. So if I, I unclick that option and I put an 11 and a 12 on top of each other, the 12 just stays on top of the 11. As a default, when you go to Polypad, the merge number tiles option is there. Again, you can type in any number you want. And so I could put a hundred on top of that. You can type in negative numbers. If I want to put a negative 50 on top of that, we could see what happens. Um, and so we could even add a negative 65. Oh, I missed the negative. We could do a negative 65. Hopefully it'll show us the zero. Yeah, there's the zero. And this is a little preview to solving equations that I want to show in a few minutes using the number cards. We have a multiplication grid. Um, one feature I think is awesome about this, this multiplication grid. Obviously, as I, as I drag this down, it makes um, a hundred box and a 10 and the ones. So you could show any base 10 multiplication that you would want students to engage with. But there's this black circle here that you can drag to change the size of, of the square. So as opposed to always doing base 10 multiplication, you could have students just engage with this without calling it 
base five multiplication and have them think about what each bar is, right? This is a 25 and a 25 and these are fives. And uh, you know, that, that ability to change really easily what you want that grid to be, I think can be really powerful exploration for students as they're making sense of numbers. Um, we added a wreck and wreck a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so now, um, where you can move these around. You can change the colors. I know most of the ones that students use are red and white. So down here, you can make it red. There is a slider if you want to make it all red, you can move the slider over to make it as red as you like to more fit with maybe what students would see in school. You can copy them to put a couple of them on the screen. Uh, I'm not gonna spend time talking about exploding dots. There's some great work with uh, the Global Math Project and James Tanton. Bucket of Zero was just added this past week from Nat Banting. There's a website where you can read a lot more about the Bucket of Zeros, but I wanna, I wanna keep going on because I have so much to share when I'm just in the number section. Fractions, let me dive into fractions. You can take a fraction strip and put it on the canvas. Here is one fifth. There's a tab here that allows you to extend and collapse the fraction strip. So I could put a one there and compare that to one. Um, this fraction bar you could split up into pieces so I can move those around if I wanted to. You can do the same with the fraction circles. I'm not gonna show an example of that. And then in the algebra section, we have the algebra tiles. Here's a one and a negative one. I've used these a lot this year to make zero pairs, very much on par with the bucket of zero idea. So you can take these and you could copy those to represent integer addition and subtraction. Of course, here's the algebra tiles for factoring and stuff, all sorts of, of lessons that we have on Mathagon. I can show you with the algebra tiles. And here's the balance scale. And so the balance scale can be a nice introduction to thinking about equations. Uh, let me go a little slower on the balance scale. This is uh, you know, the first, uh, the first pass of the balance scale. There's a lot more features of the balance scale that are gonna be coming soon to a polypad near you. For now, all of these objects when you put them on the scale, the default weight is one. So you can see now if I go to a number card and put a one here on the other side, it'll balance the scale. But if I wanted to say put a 13 over here and a five over here, and I have this prepared in advance and then I share it with my students, if I click balance now, the polypad is going to assign the number to this weight to make the scale balance. So I can click balance and then put this on a, poly, on a poly pad to assign to my students. Now this is eight, right? And so I could begin to think about what do we want to do to balance the scale? Is it balanced if I put an eight on one side and a negative eight on the other? We know that's not going to work, but for some students, they might say, oh, let's subtract eight over here and add eight over here. That did not balance the scale, right? There are some students that might just want to like, oh, I don't know why I did eight. That's the answer. I meant five and negative five, right? I've had a full day of teaching like many of you, so my arithmetic mistakes are gonna be happening a bunch over the course of this webinar. Five and negative five would make more sense to do. There are some students just wanna put a negative five here, right? And so one, I like that students see that makes that scale come up, right? And to keep it balanced, of course, we need to put negative five on both sides. And now it's balanced, and then we can make a zero pair here and show that that's eight and get rid of the zero. I think that can be a really powerful tool for students as they're just beginning to think about what it means to do something to the same side of an equation and make sure the scale stays balanced. So that's one idea about um, uh, thinking about equations. Um, the few last things I'm gonna show you and then I'm gonna share some activities I've done in school that might be helpful. In the probability section, there's dice. So you can put a dice on, this, on the canvas and spin it. There's coins. So here I'm gonna, take the coin and flip it. The ability to copy these so quickly, I think is of great value for students to see lots of things happening in a probability um, event or a probability uh, simulation. I'm gonna share canvases in a few minutes where there's a hundred coins on the screen or a hundred dice, but they can all be spun at the same time to get lots and lots of trials of data. There are spinners. Here's a uniform spinner and a custom spinner. The differences are, in the uniform spinner, all the, all the sections are the same size. If you take this point and drag it around, you can change the number of sections. So there's 16 and I can spin it. On the custom spinner, you can change the size of the region. And so all sorts of wonderful activities could be done by changing the sizes of these. If you click on the circle, it'll add a region. So just like on the custom polygon where you clicked on the edge to add 
a vertex here, you do the same to add a region to the spinner. And if you want to get rid of one, you can, you can click on that. Playing cards just came out this past week or maybe a week ago now. So you could put a playing card on the screen. You could put the card on and flip it. One feature that we know will take this nice visual and make it really, really useful in, in class is the ability to put all the cards on a canvas at once and then choose a card at random and shuffle them. So that is not there yet, but is definitely on the to-do list. And then there are non-transitive dice, which um, I'm not gonna talk about today, but I can happily answer questions about at the end of the webinar. And then tools and utensils. We have number lines and coordinate system. There's a grid you can put on the canvas. Um, protractors and rulers to measure if I wanted to measure the size of this thing, right? Um, this kind of, you know, it snaps nicely. So as I take this and I make the protractor smaller, it snaps uh, to the region on, on the spinner nicely. There's tables and a question building feature, which I've used so much this year, where as a teacher, you can put an answer box on a canvas with the right answer. And when you assign it to students, they have to put in the correct answer. I will share an example of that in a few minutes. But look at this in, in 15 minutes or so, we've explored all these wonderful tools. I skipped a lot of them, but one fun feature that I've used a lot is that the scale, this scale works with all of the things on Polypath. So if I take the scale and move it over here and put a five over here and a three over here, it's not gonna be balanced. But if I go to the number tiles and put two over here, it'll balance. All of these, all of these tools work. If I put two fifths over here and then go to the fraction and get a 10th, oh, that's not what I meant. Uh, I wanted to do two tenths and a fifth, right? As I said, my arithmetic skills this time of day. There we go, now it's balanced. I got my fractions right. And so that, that ability to use the scale to look at equality across n different visuals for numbers and fractions, uh, I think is a, a really powerful tool. The other thing we added this week, and then I'll get to some examples I've, I've done with my students, is the ability to change this from a fraction to a percent to a decimal. So that just came out Monday of this week. We are constantly getting new features out, out on Polypad, um, and I'm, I'm excited about some of the other ideas we have coming soon as well. So I'm gonna move on to some examples. Any, any questions, Eric, that have come up that I should pause here to um, talk about? So most of the, the uh, chat is filling up with people sharing about how they have used oh, uh, awesome. Polypad. That's so great. Uh, we yeah, have examples exactly. of using it to um, explore the area and perimeter of quadrilaterals, so uh, heading into the area of triangles and parallelograms. Uh, we've got examples of using the algebra tiles for expanding and factoring, the dice and coins for data management uh, and simulations, uh, the Monty Hall activity for data for the data management class. Um, there's a question that did come in, uh, says, is there a way to automatically tally the total of a dice roll? Um, I, uh, the question says, I thought I saw somewhere where you could roll multiple times and the total would be calculated for each roll and recorded. It is not there yet. I have, uh, as you were chatting, I pulled up a canvas that is in our template section, which I can show people how to find that in a minute. There is not the ability yet to automatically tally the number that have come up. That is on our requested feature list. Uh, and so as you might imagine, that list gets longer and longer rather than shorter. We continue to cross things off, but there's so many wonderful ideas that teachers have out there, which is great. Uh, and we love that people will pass those ideas along. The ability to tally these would be great. So that will be will be coming at some point. Well, that's, well, that's fantastic. Uh, the only question that I've had um, uh, that I was thinking about, and I'm sure you're going to get to that at some point, is I've heard you mention several times about, you know, sharing these activities with your students and so forth. So uh, I am curious about the idea of um, taking things you create in here and making them available to students, or is it collaborative? Can, you know, more than one person be on a polypad at once? Things, things like that. I'm sure you're going to get to those, but just so you know, that's, that's what's been uh, running through my mind as I've been Great. seeing yeah. these. Let's talk about that right now, because that is a great question. So this is a polypad that 
Um, I have a daughter in second grade and I saw some homeworks that her teachers had her come home with, which were great. It was the number bond and she was really engaged by that. And I was thinking, how could I take that idea and put it on a polypad? So this is a canvas that I, I thought could be helpful with younger students where the instructions are add number tiles or bars or cards to balance the scale. So the first thing that I wanna share at the top of the library here is a link to our tutorials. There are a number of videos here about how to make classes, how to share it in Google Classroom. Here's a link to uh, some webinars that we've done. So I'm gonna give a, a quick overview of that. Feel free to come back here. Again, this is right in Polypad under library is a link to all the tutorials. What I wanna show you right now is how to share it within a Mathagon class. So I have a teacher account. This is my Mathagon account. In my teacher account, I synced it right with my Google Classroom. All my students were automatically imported into my Mathagon class. For right now, in this account, I just have a sample class, but in my teacher account, all my classes are there. I'm gonna assign it to that class. So I've shared it with that class. My daughter, who I just referenced, she of course has a Mathagon account. Her name is Emily. So now I'm in, I'm in a different browser and you can see I'm in her account, Emily Porras, on her student dashboard. And now under her, her library, if I do a refresh, you can see now there's that assignment. So I just assigned that to her class and it shows up in her assignments. And so she could do some work on this, right? Maybe she on the first scale knows that it's a seven. And so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do one. Maybe she takes a number bar and puts a seven there and sees that it's balanced. Maybe on this one, she wants to put a 12 to balance it. And she would go through and do it. In the interest of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here. If she hits save, we do have a, a feature coming soon where it'll automatically save as students do the work. That's not there yet. So she has to hit save. And then on the teacher end, I'm now back on my teacher account. If I hit um, a refresh or a reload, I can see her canvas. And so there's her name. Um, I could decide to show her name or not. And so if I click on it, I can see her work, right? I can see she added a seven here and a 12 here. And that ability on the teacher end now to have all my students work, uh, you know, whether I want students to, to see the names of the polypad or not, I might focus as a teacher, I really wanna know how students balanced, you know, this last one. Maybe there were students that used tiles or cards or so on. Um, so that's the ability to share it in, in Mathagon. I'm now back in my library. There is an option under share embed to share it into Google Classroom. And the same thing would happen, it would take a link and it would automatically make an assignment in Google Classroom and you could do the typical Google Classroomy things, make points and categories, and it'll automatically take this polypad link up here at the top and assign it to them in Google Classroom. What is not available yet, Eric, which is coming in the fall, is the ability for multiple users to work on the same canvas at once. So now she did her work, she saved it, and now I can see it. I'm not able to make changes to it and have her see it in real time. And as she's working, I can't see the changes in real time or two students could not work on one canvas at the same time. So that is coming by fall 2021. Uh, it's, it's the most commonly asked about question on Polypad, can multiple people play a game at the same time? It is coming soon, but not there yet. Um, and we're really excited about that feature because we know that'll be uh, a game changer for a lot of folks. Let me show you one other example. And then I do want to get to some other things on, on Polypad as well. There's also a link at the top here to a new canvas, which I've probably done a few times, the tutorials that I showed you. And then there's a link to our activities page, which is mathagon.org slash tasks. And here is a whole host of ways to engage students with mathematics on Polypad. There are student explorations, which a student would do on this page, lesson plans, puzzles and games, teaching ideas and tutorials. One that I wanna share with you is on exploring the mean that I did with my students in sixth grade. This is under the category of teaching idea because it starts with me doing a video. It's only a two minute video about how you might take these canvases and use them in school. Here's another video with a follow-up. And then there's links to the actual canvases. So here's a canvas that I assigned to my students. I wanna share it with you because it has an example of a question builder feature. Now I made this as a teacher. This is a different account that I'm doing. In my teacher account, when I look at it as a teacher, it would show the answer here. So now I'm gonna pretend like I'm a student because I'm, I'm, I'm viewing this in a different Mathagon account. And I just assigned this to my students with no instructions. It was just, it was their warm up. 
and said, arrange the tiles below into five equal stacks. And so a lot of kids, you know, just started and moved, moved things around and eventually got to a number that was 15. And in the, in the question builder, when you get it right, if that's the last one to get right, confetti comes down on the screen and it's a lot of fun. And so then there were a couple other ones that I, I assigned to them and they did. But then as a class, I talked about another way to, oh, I want to use the ruler to make a straight line. You could see there, I was doing the pen tool. There's a, a thicker marker you can use and a highlighter, which I haven't talked at all about. So all sorts of nice ways to draw. The ruler allows you to draw a straight line. So I'm gonna draw a straight line. Oh, I missed, let me try it again. I'm gonna draw a straight line at the top of the smallest bar. And what we talked about as kids is another way to show a visual of what's happening is I could take all of these tiles and because these are number tiles, I can merge them. It goes to the top for some reason and I can spin it around. And now I need to take these and split it up into the five groups. And so we could take them and it automatically makes a rectangular array with five columns. And then I can split them and there we go. Another way to show the mean, right? Taking all the leftovers above the smallest one and splitting them up into five equal groups. And this, you know, was a great introduction into what we mean visually by the mean of a set of numbers. I had students at the end of this unit, they wanted to go use Polypad anytime they, they, they were finding the mean of a set of numbers. And I was like, great, go for it. Eventually, for most kids, right, they began to get to a more, more efficient process. But for some, the safety of doing it with the number tiles was, was, uh, was wonderful for them. And, you know, they, they went off and, and used the number tiles. Back to a, a comment of Eric's at the beginning. I've used the physical tools in school as a teacher for a while. Integer tiles, right? I've done addition with integer tiles for years. I had them in the Ziploc bags. We did a day or two of them. I put them on the shelf in my classroom and said to the class, Anytime you want the integer tiles, go get them. Quiz, homework, warm up, I don't care. They're there for you to use. And invariably, kids would not go get them. And I think as sixth and seventh graders, there's something about a manipulative being like maybe a babyish kind of tool, right? Despite my great efforts to make a safe environment where any tool you want and we learn in different, all that, kids didn't want to go get the plastic bag off the shelf. This year, I didn't use the actual chips because of, of COVID, right? Even though Kids were in person for me at the time. We still couldn't pass out all the manipulatives. So we did it on Polypad with the ones and negative ones that I showed you. And I found that the kids that needed to use them because so much of the time was on their device, they would go use them. There was something safe for them about doing it in a way that they weren't showing to everyone else whether they had abstracted the ideas yet or still needed the, the virtual tools, right? And that, that was a great moment, right? Back to that conversation about let's choose tools that can help kids own their own learning, right? I found that allowing them to use this really helped them own, own their learning a little bit. Um, any that questions, is, Eric? Really, I can keep that talking. Really, oh my goodness, that's really encouraging. Yeah. I, I love that idea of taking away that uh, stigma or the uncomfortableness of, of uh, grabbing the physical items, but using the digital ones instead. Um, but it just, I, I love how the whole concept with, with math many times is, is we're trying to help students transition from concrete to abstract. And um, I love how this does that. It lets them move at their own pace. If you need to go back to the concrete, you can do that. A lot of times when you know, I talk about uh, fun ways to use technology with math, I'll talk about using in Google Docs using the, the emoji option to represent variables. Instead of having, you know, X's and Y's, I use chickens and pigs. And, you know, it's concrete and we can add them and multiply and distribute. And it makes sense because we're talking about actual animals. And then we can little by little move it into, well, let's use letters instead. And, you know, uh, and I, that's what I love about this is that for the students that need to spend a little more time referring back to the concrete examples, it does that for them. Uh, we did have a couple of questions. Um, one forward. that had come up was related to the sharing. You had mentioned about pushing this out to Google Classroom, wonderful. We do have some folks that use different LMSs though. And there was a question about, um, and I didn't see because it came up kind of quickly on the screen, were there other 
places you can directly share to. I, I saw, for example, I think somebody asked about, about Schoology as an example, as a pretty popular LMS, or would they just be taking the link and then copying yeah. it over there themselves? So I think in the um, share and embed one, the only sort of, um, you know, yeah. school tool is Google Classroom, sure. but okay. there's an option here just to, just to copy the link. And then you can take that link and put it anywhere that you share a link with students. There's also at the top here in the URL is a link to that canvas. So, you know, I often will just, if, if I want to get a link to the URL, I just go up to the, up, up to the toolbar here and copy it. And then I can go to any new, any new uh, browser tab and, and just paste it. So any of those, you know, uh, canvas or Schoology, just take the link and copy it. Now, when somebody copies that link, so are they basically getting a template at that point and they're making a copy of that yep. template? So, you know, if this is a, a URL, if I go back to my incognito browser where I'm logged in on Mathagon in my daughter's account, um, if she works on this and wanted to save her work and she does and she selects a uh, save copy in the library, it now makes a different a different um, I see. canvas that is now saved to her account. And then when she would share that back to me, either in Google Classroom, you know, there's the option here as a student, she could share it into Google Classroom, but in Canvas or, or, or something else, she would just get that link and copy it into however she turns in links to her teacher. I see, okay. Well, that's gonna be an interesting uh, technology uh, paradigm shift when you guys start yeah. doing the, the collaborative stuff yeah. in the fall. Yeah, uh, so excited to see what that's yeah, going to look like. Right. And that, awesome. you know, a part of the challenge is there are times where you don't want it to be collaborative, right? Where you just want students to be able to make a copy and do their work. So that's part of the, of the options to attempt to figure out. Excellent. Thanks. Awesome. I have a few other things to share. I know um, we want to leave time for questions at the end. I am so I'm in school now and the PA system is going through an awful squeaking thing right now. So uh, that's why I was muted for a few seconds while, while Eric was talking, hopefully it'll stop. A few other tasks that I wanna share that I found really powerful with students is um, we have a whole menu of visual patterns. Um, you know, Fawn over at, uh, at visualpatterns.org has done incredible work in how to use visual patterns to uh, engage students in, in deep mathematical thinking. Um, algebraic thinking. Here's a canvas that I made uh, based on visual pattern 19 at visualpatterns.org. Um, I like this that students, as they put in the number of tiles that are there, they get the feedback. Oh, I counted wrong. It's about 10 maybe. Right. But what I want to share is what happened in my class. I'm going to copy this and just go to a new canvas. Yeah, but I don't need those changes. Um, and paste it. There we go. And I'm gonna make a few copies of this because, you know, as a teacher, obviously, when we do a visual pattern, we think about what the students might share as they're doing it. And so as student, you know, this was a, an assignment in class and of, as expected, I had students, I'm just gonna mash these up with the grids. I had students say that they saw it as a big rectangle here. And then there were two off on the side, right? So they described that rectangle. They we put the algebra in there, it was great. And then there were students that said they Whoever saw it the PA, please stop doing that at this point. as a square and then a rectangle. We have kids who have figured out how to hack into the PA system and are making it squeak, right? So they talked about that. And then of course there were students who talked about how they envisioned the whole thing as a rectangle. And so they, um, they, had it filled in, and then they figured out what they needed uh, to subtract. That was all great. We went through it at the sixth one. We did the algebra. We saw they were all the same. And then there was a student who began to describe how she saw it. And in previous years, in previous years, when I do this on the whiteboard, the whiteboard's a mess. Kids have done it on paper. I try to project it under the doc viewer. It's really hard for kids to describe, you know, what they saw. And here, you know, there was a student who said that she saw it. She said, can you just kind of pretend that that long one's not there? And because I was doing it on Polypad, I could say, I don't need to pretend, we can just move it out of the way. And she was like, oh, that's so cool. And then she's like, now I just kind of pretend that other one gets moved over. And again, I was like, Kate, we don't need to pretend, I can just move it over. There's a little bit of a wow. 
And then she said, now take that one and kind of like spin it around and move it up. And I was like, I can do that. And so I spun it around and moved it up. And she said, yeah, I did that. And I saw this as a square with one left over. And all the kids were like, that was so cool. And I was struck as a teacher that she was having trouble explaining what she was visualizing here. But because the tool was up and I was able to actually move things and spin them and change the color, she got that moment in class where kids saw the awesome thing that she was visualizing this pattern. And I hate to say it, but if I was doing it on the whiteboard, I don't know if I would have been able to really capture what she was visualizing in this pattern. And she might not have gotten that amazing, like wow moment in class. Um, and again, I think it came back to being having, having this tool up and ready to go was a really, really powerful thing for her. Um, so that was exciting. Uh, some other tasks that I, I wanted to share. We have a whole set of puzzles and games. Uh, my favorite one that I did in class today, um, we had an, you know, an extra five minutes and I said, all right, everyone go to Google Classroom, pull up the puzzle of the day. And the puzzle of the day is made by a puzzle maker in Norway. There's a link, he, he's, he's given us permission to have this on Mathagon. I have the actual puzzle. It is a wonderful wooden, well-crafted puzzle. It was about $30 to get it shipped to my house from Norway. Uh, so I encourage you, if you like this puzzle, to buy one because he's a small independent puzzle maker. But the goal of the puzzle is to use all these pieces to cover everything except the day of the month that it is. So what's today? May 13th. So a number of my students started off like this and then they tried to get the 13 covered. You can flip them and you can spin them and rotate them, but you can't cut them. We can't turn off the cut tool yet in Mathagon. But of course the challenge is, can you do this without, without cutting it? I'm gonna stop here. We don't have time to go through the puzzle, but it's every day is a different puzzle. And some my students get it really quickly. Some we do five minutes in class and we don't get it. And invariably I get a couple emails later that night of a screenshot of a kid that finished the puzzle, which how wonderful is that? Uh, I really encourage them to go buy it as well because I think it's a, I think it's a great puzzle. Um, I'm gonna leave Polypad. I have, I have a whole list of things I wanted to share on Polypad that I don't have time to. I encourage you to check out the puzzles or the uh, task page because just taking a look at the visuals, there's so many wonderful ideas from people all around Mathagon. If you have ideas of things that you've done, it was great to hear from Eric. People in the chat have shared what they've been doing on Polypad. There's something called contribute new tasks. There's two options. If you just have a polypad that you think is great to do with students, there's a Google form uh, where you can just put the link to the polypad, a one sentence or two description of how, you, how you've used it with students. Um, and we'd love to get that task and put it up on the task page. There's also like these custom tasks where if you have an idea of embedding polypads in some sort of mathematical exploration, we'd love to, to work with you to get that up on Mathagon as well. One example that I wanna share um, is by James Tanton from Exploding Dots and the Global Math Project. He put out a video a couple of weeks ago about what made him a mathematician with this puzzle of, of, uh, of tracing grids on a five by five grid. And we worked with him to make a, a Mathagon version of that. So we took his video and broke his video up into chunks and then embedded a canvas where students could actually do it or adults, anyone who wants to go experience joyful mathematics. And the challenge here is to, oops, have a grid, let me try that again, that goes through every box only once, right? There we go, I did it. And then he talks about all the options here. So here's a couple of gifts of the option. And you could go through and explore this. And then there are some videos of, of him talking about it. And it, it really is um, a wonderful story of what got him excited about mathematics uh, with the option for students to go through what he's talking about in this task. So that is, is another option. If, if there are ideas that folks have out there about how to write a Mathagon task, I'd love to work with you to get that up there as well. Now, David, right. I saw that you've got that actually embedded, that interactive uh, polypad activity embedded. Is that something that uh, that anybody can do or something yeah. you guys did? Is, is embedding an option? It is embedding an option. So in the tutorial section, as Eric was talking, I just went to uh, tutorials. And in the tutorial option, there is a video on how to embed polypad in Google Sites. But also on the contribute page, um, there are instructions about how, about how to embed polypads in, in sites as well. 
Um, Polypad is free for teachers and students. Any teacher or student embedding a Polypad into work that they're doing with students that obviously is free as well is a great use of the source. Obviously a, uh, a publisher or something who's taking a Polypad and doing a commercial product um, with an embedded Polypad is above and beyond the free scope of Mathagon, right? Just to put that out there. But teachers who are listening to this, go embed away into any Google site that you have or website. And if you have a task that you think would be great for our task page, we'd love to get that up there. Well, that is fantastic. Um, I know a lot of uh, folks have been using Google Sites, um, especially, you know, the new version, how, how powerful that is and how easy it is to use. That's wonderful to see that we can embed the polypads right in there. Uh, just a heads up to the people who are watching live here. We're down to about our last 10 minutes. So um, Dave's going to be sharing some other amazing resources, but I just wanted to remind you, if you have questions or comments, this would be a great time to continue to throw those in the chat and I'll do my best to get them over to David while we still have time for him to address them. Uh, but uh, Dave, let me turn it back over to you. Great. I'm, it's, I apologize. I'm talking fast, everyone. I have so much things that I'm just so excited about on Mathagon that I have two last things to show you, and then I'll stay and answer any questions people have. Um, we also have these courses, right? I've been talking for 40, 50 minutes or so just about Polypad. There's this whole other part of Mathagon that are courses. A lot of them are are under construction, we are hard at work behind the scenes getting more content out there. Uh, just, just, just to show you a quick example of how the courses work, I'm gonna go to the um, introduction to sequences and patterns. And what's nice about these courses is it starts with a block of text. So here's or a, a, a small chunk of something, here's some text to read. And then there's some, some math for students to do. So um, here's a text box I have to fill in. You can see in the bottom right hand corner, if I get something right, what's this going up by 318? Oh, well done, I got it right. 18 plus three is not 20, but if I say 20, it says that doesn't look right, try again. And then I could fix that and get 21. I think these are going up by six. So what's that 34 and 40? Nice feedback from our tutor. This is up one and then up three. I think I've done these enough. So I kind of got them memorized and this is doubling, right? So 32 and then 64, but what I want to show you is as a student completes a section of the course additional content appears and so I think just as an entry for students the fact that the screen isn't scrolling of text and questions is is inviting and feels like a safe way to just you know like just start and then this is x to the n and then there's a section on the triangle numbers that comes up as a teacher if you want to know what the whole course is obviously that's important you can go down and um, if students are stuck, they can skip to the next step, or you could see, you know, the entire course at once. So I'm not going to go through and do all this, but those options are there as well. Um, so go explore the courses. They're, they're wonderful to do. Um, again, we're hard at work in getting a lot more content out there. There are options that we have on our list of being able, you know, a student not being able to, sh to, to skip a step or see all the steps at once, and the teacher could control what they would want a student to do. The last thing that I, I, I want to show you is our multiplication by heart uh, flashcards. So I'm gonna to go to activities. There's a timeline of mathematics, go explore that. There's a almanac of interesting numbers, but I wanna to go to this multiplication by heart flashcards. I'm in my daughter's account now, and you can see she's kind of in the middle of the multiplication by heart flashcards. She has a number of flashcards in different boxes. So as I do a couple, I get a nice little sound effect if I got them right. Um, we have a, a, a whole video coming up soon on the multiplication by heart flashcards. Again, they're in collaboration with Dan Finkel at Math for Love. What I want to show you is just the idea of, of spaced repetition. So what happens in spaced repetition is if my daughter gets a card, gets a fact correct, it goes into the next box. So I was just in box D. She got one right and went into box E. If I get one wrong, let's say I say this is nine, I get a chance to do it again. You can see I'm in box D right here. If I get it wrong again, you can see now that goes back to box A. Box A became three. So anytime you get a card wrong, it goes back to box A. And what the program does is it decides based on what day it is, which cards that you should see. So cards in box A, you see them for the first time on that day, or if you got them wrong, you're gonna see them on uh, the following day. Cards in box B, you see after two days. Basically, the idea is once you've got it right, as you continue to get it right, 
the program is going to space out the duration from when you see that card again with the thinking that the time coming when you might forget that fact, it's going to pop up again. And so it'll, a card will sit in box E for two or three weeks before a student sees that fact again. And then when it comes up again, if they get it right, it goes into the memory box. If they get it wrong, it goes all the way back to box A and the process starts all over again. On the teacher side of things, you have access to how your students are doing. So I'm in my teacher dashboard in my sample class. Again, this is my Mathagon account, not, my, not the account I use as a teacher. My kids are in this class. And I go to the multiplication dashboard. Um, my son's in, in fifth grade and he knows his facts pretty well, so he hasn't done any. But my daughter, I just did some and I can see the number of cards in the boxes. And then if there were a, if there were a whole class here, I could see on average how my, how my class was doing on each multiplication fact. So I could pull this up as a class and say, look, you know, we're really not doing well on, on our, our eights facts. We're gonna practice that as a class. One feature we're hopefully gonna add for the fall is the ability to see this grid for individual students. Currently, it's as a whole class, um, but a lot of teachers have been asking about, you know, if you click on a student, could you see the facts that they're doing really well on or the ones they need some additional practice on? So that's the multiplication by heart flashcards. Um, let me just go back to Mathagon. Again, there's a number of activities. I'm gonna stop talking now because it's 425 and I wanna get to any questions they have. Um, but feel free to come back to Mathagon, go to the tutorials. We have old webinars. Um, if you don't have an account, when you make an account, you'll get on the Mathagon email list. We have web, we'll have webinars over the course of the summer that do a deep dive into specific topics. Last night I did an hour webinar on just probability. And we spent, you know, we did a deep dive on probability a couple of weeks ago on numbers. Those will be on, on, on the website soon. So now I real, will really stop talking. Uh -huh. Well, again, that is fantastic. I, we did have one other question come Great. in. Um, the question was asking about, um, are there instructional routines available or what would you recommend as an instructional routine? And I wasn't familiar with that phrase. And so the, uh, the, the person asking the question clarified saying things such as number talks, number of the day, which one doesn't belong, things like that. Uh, if that makes sense to you, David, I'll let you address that. We, um, all sorts of wonderful ideas. There is not an, on our task page, there is not a category for number talks or which one doesn't belong or open middles. Uh, we've seen on Twitter, a lot of teacher doing, a lot of teachers doing those, um, you know, those ideas. Uh, I think I had an open middle in here somewhere that I just wanted to share. Yeah, here's an example of an open middle. Um, and so I think that that is something that is on our list is to make a library of those types of activities that teachers do. Um, I didn't show you the templates, which I think can be helpful as well. So just um, as an example, we do have sort of this task page on visual patterns that has a whole bunch of visual patterns. At the, at, at the start of this page are a few videos about how you could use these tools on Polypad to engage your students in thinking about visual patterns. And then there's about 20 example or not, there's 20 visual patterns made on a polypad that a teacher could, could open and save a copy to their account and then assign it, assign, assign that visual pattern to their students. So I think, or I know that's something we've been talking about is that idea of here's a task page on which one doesn't belong, some instructional tips and then a whole bunch of polypads with those. So. The short answer is no. The long answer is great idea, hopefully coming soon. <laughs> well, that, that is fantastic. Uh, uh, there was another question about um, when somebody signs up um, to log in to, uh, to Mathagon, um, what if they signed up as a student? Can yeah. they switch to be a teacher? They can. So if I go to my daughter's account and I go to account settings, uh, you scroll down a little bit, you can change it to a teacher account. All right. Um, and so that's an easy thing to do. And then in, in the teacher account, the, uh, the class tab is going to be there, which it's not in students account. And I didn't talk a lot uh, in this webinar about the question builder tool. I showed one polypad with how to use the question builder. That's only there in a teacher account. Uh, so only teachers can add, add questions to the canvas. But of course, on the tutorial page, there's a video about how to use the question builder, the question builder feature. 
Well, David, I want to thank you so much again for taking the time to uh, present this to us today. And I want, I want to thank you for being a part of an organization that's providing such a valuable tool for free uh, to uh, schools, to teachers, to students. I want to thank everybody who joined us today for taking an hour out of your day uh, for those joining us live and those who are watching the recording. And yes, this uh, is available as a recording for those who want to share with others the exact same YouTube link that uh, you're watching this at now. We'll hold the recording and my Control Alt Achieve site, controlaltachieve.com, where we had the original post about this. We'll also have the recording there as well. Um, and I'm sure David, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do so? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm on Twitter at David Porras, uh, D-A-V-I-D-P-O-R-A-S. On Mathagon, there is an FAQ at the bottom. So any questions that you have, go check out uh, you know, the FAQ. And if your question is an answer there, there's, there's an option at the bottom of the FAQ to get in touch with us at Mathagon. I also want to say thank you to Eric as a, as a teacher for 20 years. I've been a fan of your work for a long time. So it's a real honor to be on this webinar and talk about Mathagon. Um, so thanks for coming everyone. Thanks for having me, Eric. I really enjoyed the time together. And, um, you know, please folks get, you know, share with the world what you're doing on Mathagon, either on the, on the contribute page, if there's a polypad that you wanna get on our task page, we will have your name up there. You'll be the author of it. Um, you know, please share on Twitter what you're doing with Mathagon. We, we you know, really enjoy what, uh, we enjoy seeing what teachers are doing out there. Well, I'll tell you, uh, the teachers who, uh, the educators who joined us today um, are very excited. Uh, looking at the uh, chat over here, seeing some wonderful feedback and people really excited about this. So thanks again to everybody. And uh, we we'll look forward to seeing all that you're going to do with this tool and how it's going to impact uh, student learning and excited to see the new things that will be rolling out with Mathagon in the near future. Thanks, everybody. And take care. Thank you.